Hey guys, it's Dorn with Tactical Hive. Today's video, we're going to be talking about the weapon upgrades you need. The how, the why, and so let's get into it. Hey guys, today's video is brought to us by Vetter Holsters. All right, if you have a pistol, that pistol needs a holster. Maybe it needs more than one, depending on the application. We here at the channel, we use Vetter Holsters both when making content as well as in our classes. So go ahead and check them out in the description below. They can pretty much match you up with any major make model uh, pistol with the, the holster you're looking for. Well, let's get to the video. All right, guys. So again, here we are. We're going to talk about... Uh, Weapon upgrades. So, you know, we're starting out, you know, I mean, I did shit a little bit growing up. You know, I wasn't, my family wasn't super into guns, but we of course had them for all the common sense reasons. We did shoot, but really my journey with firearms started when I joined the military. I went directly to BUDS um, after getting through the initial training with the Navy. And I, I just shot bone stock guns, bone stock M4s, both the 14 and a half and 10.3 inch variants as well as uh, pretty much SIG 226s, and they were pretty much bone stock. Um, you know, obviously the primaries had all the, you know, modern accoutrements. This is actually a, a remake or a, a retro, whatever you want to call it, um, clone of that. And um, I've got a two 320s up here, which is just the modern equivalent of the P226, as well as a more modern tricked out uh, AR-15 that replaced the M4A1 as we know it at my last job. So starting out, you know, with your journey, you know, if you're new to firearms or you're looking to up your game, getting into the tactical shooting, the sports shooting, I highly recommend starting with bone stock equipment and establishing a baseline with, with um, you know, pretty much nothing, you know, cheap or poorly made or anything like that. But, you know, things that are just going to be considered, you know, baseline effective and uh, those, th those uh, types of of platforms tend to be a little bit easier on the pocketbook and they tend to be much, much more reliable. Um, and, and as you get into shooting, you'll, you know, you can try out different stuff, see what you like, see what you don't like. So start with bone stock equipment. Um, that's just my advice. I think being able to go back to uh, weapon systems that aren't as Gucci as maybe what you currently are using, you know, for whatever reason, you got to pick something up that's bone stock. You have that baseline, you have that experience. You, you can draw back on that and be effective with, you know, not as refined equipment. But again, that's just my advice to you. So you go ahead, you purchase your first pistol, your first carbine, whatever it is, and you start, you know, you get into it, you start shooting and you're like, all right, I want to do more. I want to do better. So a couple of things. If we're just trying to shoot more accurately, we're more concerned about what happens on the range versus real life, then I'm going to go ahead and say that the trigger is probably going to be the number one. Upgrading the trigger on an AR-15. It can also help on pistols. It's not as dramatic, I don't think, but um, upgrading the trigger. So this pistol has an X trigger, line trigger on the SIG, which is one step up from bone stock. I went ahead and just started there um, because I'd already been shooting for decades. and wasn't that worried about it. This one over here has the gray guns trigger, which is even an upgrade from the X line. I don't currently have a standard 320 trigger pack here, but there's basically three levels. You have the standard, you have the X, and then you have the, the bad boy, the gray guns. If you're new to 320, honestly, it doesn't cost more to just go with the X, really, maybe a little bit more. I would suggest just starting on the X line. If you want to go crazy, go ahead and look into the gray guns. On the AR-15s, you know, they all pretty much have a, you know, mil spec bone stock trigger pack that you can go with. Most entry to mid-level guns come with that um, mil spec if you want trigger, but you can easily upgrade them and they're not very hard. Uh, we did a review on the gold trigger not too long ago and it had what it was called a cartridge trigger where the entire trigger pack is one piece and they're super easy to install. And then you have the multiple piece one. This is a Geisley. Uh, we upgraded at work all of the weapon platforms, uh, the AR-15 variants, Mark 18, whatever you want to call them, uh, started coming with the Geisley triggers. And once I went to those, 
I never looked back. I bought a few of them and put them in my guns. This one is curved and does look uh, like a normal trigger, but you can also get the blade triggers, which Miles has over on this one, which is also a Geisley. So you can get the blade or the standard look, but these are both made by Geisley. We use these. We also use the gold triggers, which are made by AR Gold. And we use a whole bunch of other ones. I'm not really here to plug any particular one, but do your research. And when you switch from a bone stock trigger, be it on a pistol or a rifle, you are going to know that, be able to see the difference, especially with rapid fire. They reset better, lighter trigger pull. Some of them are adjustable. If you want to get into that, be careful. Um, if you're going to be moving around and doing, you know, dynamic tactical type training, having a trigger that is too light can and will bite you or someone else if you get my drift. And I have seen that happen. So be careful. So that's what triggers. Um, before, you know, anytime you buy a carbine and want to do anything with it besides static shooting, obviously you're going to need a sling, a lot of different slings out there, but definitely having a good sling that works for you. Is something that you should probably do right out of the gate, but you can always upgrade to a different sling, a better sling that has more accoutrements based on your need. Definitely something to think about. Um, in regards to the sling, you know, having a sw uh, sling swivel mounts on your weapon system so that you can try out different sling configurations and switch back and forth based on the application, what it is you're doing with your, with your rifle, I think is a really good idea. It doesn't cost very much and it gives you that modularity. It gives you those options. I think that starting out, everybody should learn how to use iron sights and be very effective with those iron sights. But, you know, we're living in a red dot world. So, you know, I've got a 320 here on irons. I've got a 320 uh, pistol here with a red dot. Both of these carbines have uh, red dots on them. But this one has the fixed sights that are always running co-witnessed with the red dot i could pop this red dot off put a different one on take it off completely no problems and then this uh, mark 18 variant clone or whatever has the flip up irons and um, having those flip ups on there i think is a good idea being able to take the, your optics off train go back to your irons get some reps um, i think is a good idea but having the red dot is a huge upgrade it does make targeting id target engagement rapid fire engagement all of that much easier. It is a huge upgrade and I highly recommend it. But um, again, just being able to have that baseline with the irons, also something to, 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 to consider. Uh, this is an old M2 Cop aim point. It's period correct uh, with the clone. And then this is a modern EOTech period correct with this clone. This one's got a uh, laser on it. This one doesn't currently. If you're gonna upgrade with nods and lasers, Obviously, you know, that stuff's super expensive, but it does give you an extreme advantage in low light conditions. Lights. All right. So this pistol does not have a light. It's bone stock, just the iron sights. This one has both the red dot and the light being able to positively ID and effectively engage targets in a low light environment, no light environment. The light is very important. And if you plan on using this equipment if a real world application, I'm talking about combat, I'm talking about self-defense, I'm talking about violence. In the event you choose violence or you are forced into violence, being able to properly identify targets before engaging them is extremely important. If you are just shooting at things that you're not 100% sure what they are, you are rolling the dice, to say the least. And assuming that that is not going to happen, but assuming that it, you, it could happen to the point where you actually carry a gun and not having a light on it, is not wise, which is why I have lights on my, the guns that I plan on hopefully not having to use, but plan on using them in the event I do have to choose violence or I'm forced to do so, if that makes sense. So for real world application, the very first upgrade that I highly recommend on both secondary pistol and primary, you know, rifle weapon systems is a good weapon mounted light. And I'm 100% serious. You need to be able to positively identify your targets. If it's just a toy, you're just screwing around on the range, you don't need a light. Unless you're doing a night range, and then you might need a light. I don't know. Figure it out. And then as far as the light, as far as pressure pads or activating it with a switch, you know, to each their own. Um, in the tactical space, my recommendation is that your pressure pads are nowhere near where your hand naturally lies on the weapon system. 
So I've got my hand down here on this foregrip. If I need to activate the light, which is over here, it's old Surefire. Again, it's period correct, because I'm a nerd. And I'm just gonna go ahead and reach over and touch that light. I'm gonna go ahead with the plunger. I don't have a pressure pad on the light because I don't want to have light ADs, accidental discharge of light. If you broadcast your position with your light, you're going to attract bullets if you are in an actual dangerous situation. It, it happens and it happens quite frequently. So be careful of that. It's not a tactics class. This is just a, a gear class prioritizing what you need, what you don't need. Um, as far as butt stocks, you know, I have a lot of different types of butt stocks. This one again, period correct. This is a, uh, uh, I think they call it a crane stock or whatever. Um, they were very popular, very, very, very popular um, for the first half of my career. And then things started to evolve over to the more modern stuff. You know, this is a Magpul more minimalist buttstock. These are probably the best sellers. And uh, as far as the buttstock goes, you know, I've used all of them so much that it really doesn't bother me. But if you feel like having a larger buttstock so you can establish that cheek weld and that makes you a more consistent, effective shooter, then by all means, you know, try this stuff out, figure out what works for you and upgrade accordingly. Um, the pistol grips, um, I, I, I care about the pistol grips even less than I do the, uh, the buttstocks. Um, A1, I have A, you know, M16, A1 pistol grips, M16, A2 pistol grips, and then all the aftermarket ones from the 2000s, the 2010s, too many to choose from, you know, the different angles. I've used the, the crazy weird California legal ones. I've used the freaking super, uh, vertical 90 degree ones. And honestly, I don't care, but that's just me. If you figure out that one works better for you, you know, definitely do the research. They're not very expensive. You can pick and choose, switch them out. Um, definitely, you know, figure out what works for you and don't be afraid to try new things. For grips, you know, we have two different versions here. We've got the full size, full regalia, vertical grip on this one. I am a big fan of vertical grips for up close in tactical shooting. Um, and that's for retention purposes and, you know, just some other kind of close quarter combat stuff. But, you know, I just have it on this one again, because it's, it's how I rolled back in the day when we were actually using these, uh, you know, M4A1 variants. And then on this one, you know, we've got that angled foregrip. And, uh, you know, the angled foregrips are great, especially if you're in um, vegetation out in the bush, so to speak. This kind of stuff can get caught up on things, you know, branches and everything else will just kind of slide past this. And, uh, you know, being able to uh, C-clamp and really lock this thing in for longer shots um, is definitely a good idea. Um, this is more configured for that Lamb Warfare longer distance engagement, but you could use it up close as well. No problem. He's got the, uh, we got the magnifier on here to go back and forth. Magnifiers are great. When I was at my last job, I, as a sniper recce guy, didn't really use the magnifiers. I had my shorty AR set up with the red dot. And then from there I would use actual purpose built precision recce rifle, medium to long distance engagement platforms. But a lot of guys did use these. Um, they're very popular. And uh, again, it, it's very convenient. Again, it, it all comes back to, you know, being able to positively identify targets, being able to make those tough, fast decisions with all the information that you need and being able to get that information with something like a magnifier is, is, uh, is awesome. And you can just take it off. You can easily just un take this thing off and run just the one power optic, which uh, is, is easily achieved. The larger charging handles, ambi charging handles, you know, sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. You know, this is not critical enhancement, not gonna make you a better shooter, but you know, it's it's a little bit, you know, it, it helps, it can help, especially if you're really trying to shave off fractions of a second, you know, be it competition or preparing for the ultimate competition. Definitely a good idea. Sometimes I have them, sometimes I don't, not something I'm really that worried about. But again, it's an option, something to look into, but very low on the list for me. It's down there with butt stocks and pistol grips. I really don't care. I think the foregrip, as far as furniture, is probably the most important. But uh, again, that's just me. Having multiple sling attachments from the butt stock up closer to the muzzle, mid range, as well as back here behind the pistol grip. I like to run these on all my weapons just so I have that modularity. I can adapt how I set these things up based on where I am, what I'm doing, and what is expected of me. And I like to switch things around quite a bit, but again, that's just me. 
Um, as far as on the front end, you know, if you're running cans, great. If you are just worried about being on the range, shooting under normal lighting conditions, not worried about a two-way uh, situation, then by all means, go with a comp. You know, comps make you more effective. They make the gun easier to shoot. Um, you're more lethal with a comp, which is kind of funny, seeing as they're not banned, but, you know, but, uh, you know, to each their own. The flash hider will make shooting a little bit more challenging, especially during rapid fire, but it'll make you harder to find and harder to see, which will make you harder to effectively engage in during those two-way situations. So again, you got to decide what am I, what is my primary focus? What is my primary application with this equipment? Am I just trying to be as fast and efficient as possible on the range to look cool and have fun? And that's cool. That's totally cool. There's an entire industry built on competition shooting. There's another entire industry built on recreational shooting and comps are great for that. But for, you know, the less uh, desirable reasons, that's why we have flash hiders. So again, something that you should be thinking about and making a decision based upon your needs and what you expect. <laughs> All right, guys. So that's just a quick down and dirty, you know, I'm um, talking about primary weapon systems, secondary weapon systems. You know, it really comes down to you and what your primary focus is, what your primary needs are, and what you are trying to get out of these platforms. You know, are they sporting goods? Are they toys? Or are they tools meant to get us through tough situations? You know, or, or do you want a hybrid that can do one and the same? It's really up to you. But, you know, take some time, you know, and put some thought into this stuff. And, you know, my final shot, you know, as far as advice, if you're, if you're willing to take it, is don't be in a hurry to spend a bunch of money on stuff. You know, take classes, go to the range, talk to people, watch, you know, internet videos, YouTube videos like this, and try to maybe, you know, take other people's word, you know, take other people's advice, see what they're, what they're working with and why they're working with it, if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, if you like buying stuff and trying stuff out, just having a bins full of, you know, bins full of this stuff that you have try it out, use, maybe you'll go back and use later, like I do, <laughs> like so many of us do around here. Uh, that works too, guys. It's just up to you. But anyway, thank you for being here. Uh, go ahead and give us a thumbs up if you haven't, you know, if you like the video, subscribe if you haven't already done so. And, um, you know, check out that back catalog. We're approaching a thousand videos. Anyway, again, thanks for being here. This is Dora with Tactile Hive, out.